we have an unidentified flying object. I'm Jack Osborne, and you're listening. This is Hudson Hammond, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. We've got a great show for everyone here today. We have Dr. Roger Lear, the alien implant doctor. Joining me today, we have our co-host, Preston Dennett. He's a MUFON researcher of 22 years, also author of 15 books, two more being published right now. Let's bring on Dr. Roger Lear. Well, uh, hello there, John, uh, Preston. How are you today? We are doing excellent, Doctor. We are so excited to have you here because, you know, to me, you are a hero in the sense, that, first of all, you're a very kind man. You've worked really hard to uncover some incredible data and for all those out there who have opinions dr lear started as he, he works with data he's, he's an objective person that works with data and that's why what he handles is so important because the implants that he's removed and had analyzed 16 of them total right now are have all shown the the data and he's only going by the data so all those skeptics there say oh because this he's just making an opinion on that that's not the case at all and that's why i think he is the key to disclosure people keep looking in the skies asking if we're alone well guess what everybody the answer is here right here on earth with dr lear dr lear why don't we jump in and and might as well give a little background what let's talk about the first implant that you removed and, and you were a skeptic at the time and, and can you tell the listeners and how it started well yes uh, I wasn't a skeptic skeptic because uh, my interest in the field uh, dated back to 1947 without giving my age away of course <laughs> uh, I can distinctly remember my father bringing a uh, San Francisco Examiner newspaper into our kitchen and laying it out on the table and reading the headline to my mother, <laughs> which said, U.S. Army Air Force Captures Flying Saucer. And then he went into sort of a long uh, dissertation about how, see, honey, I told you we, we aren't the only uh, intelligent creatures in this vast universe and went on and on. And I, I can see that as clearly today as I did uh, when I was a young boy. So uh, skeptic, uh, no. Uh, but when it came, uh, you, you know, from something that's flying in their sky, in our skies that may be from... Uh, some other star system or some other dimension or for wherever it came from and being piloted by an alien craft was one thing but uh, to consider implantation uh, there is where the skepticism started now also I have to add uh, John uh, that at the time I got into this you have to kind of look at the historical situation of what, what was going on uh, first of all, you know, we had uh, NICAP and QFOS and uh, MUFON and a number of different organizations which fi finally uh, decided that the, the uh, that UFOs were a uh, you know three-dimensional reality and were trying to investigate it. And then, of course, we had the government or military aspect with Project Blue Book who turned into nothing Sorry, pick, go ahead and pick up where you were going on. Yeah, I was saying that, that at that time, uh, the organizations that were around, mainly MUFON, uh, was very uh, verbal. They weren't really looking at ab abduction. Apology. Now, uh, many people, I'm, I'm sure Stan Friedman does, but many people don't realize the evolution of the subject itself. So uh, when you talked about abduction, they didn't want to hear about it. Uh, uh, the star map that uh, Betty saw was uh, finally uh, brought into light and became reality, and the new Gleesey uh, computerized uh, a, a star had seen aboard a craft and then you know, you know came uh, Whitley Strieber and Travis Walton and a number of other cases in which uh, kind of propelled uh, the organizational aspect 
of course, when John Mack, Dr., the late Dr. John Mack from Harvard University, came out with the book uh, Abduction, working with Bud Hopkins, that really led to the fact that uh, abductions were a fact, were going uh, I sort of entered the the field with the implant uh, situation. Uh, the way that came about was that I was uh, belonged to Muffon and was uh, in the position what we were doing called the Vortex. And as such, uh, I would attend various meetings and I would uh, write my opinion of the uh, uh, speakers. And uh, since I felt I had, I didn't like what they had to say or <laughs> if I disagreed with them or thought they were liars, uh, I would say so. So I wasn't exactly popular uh, as, as, uh, as a writer, but people read it. Read you know, some scientific facts. And I had been raised in a scientific background, so at one time we were doing research for Dow Corning, looking for substitute for uh, bone implantation. But that's... Uh uh, one of the conferences, I was approached with a set of x-rays which happened to be of a foot. And since I'm a foot specialist, I guess uh, I was the right one to approach. And he showed me two implants, medical <laughs> records, and said, if you would like to go through these and find where she had a surgery uh, and point it out to me, I would like to see it. Would you like to take the records? Well, since this was being held in a hotel, I said, well, I'll tell you what, let me take them to my room, if you would, and tonight I'll review them, and uh, I'll let you know tomorrow. So that's exactly what happened. I looked through the records. I didn't see any evidence, and these were complete records almost since the patient was born, and I didn't see any evidence where she ever had a foot surgery or a foot injury or a fracture or anything of that nature. So I brought them back and I said, merely, uh, well, if you think these are so unusual, why don't you just take them out and see what they are? Oh. And he said, well, I think she'd probably be willing to do that, but uh, she doesn't have any money and she doesn't have any medical insurance. So <laughs> I thought for a minute and then I said, well, where does she live? And he said, in Texas. And I said, well, if you get her to California, I'll do the surgery free. Thinking in my mind all the time that, well, I'll donate a few hours of my time and prove this guy is a nutcase and prove all this is absolute nonsense and uh, I'll have some fun. So, you know, I take a couple hours, you go to the show or you go out to dinner or you see a Broadway show or something. I'll just take a couple hours and do this surgery and have a little fun. Well, up to that time, I'd taken out a variety of objects from the human body. <laughs> Everything from hair to paper to coral to metal to uh, even a hair. So... Um, during the next two weeks, he called me and he had another case with an object in the back of the hand, sent me an alien x-ray. I took it to the radiologist. Radiologist verified the fact that there was a metallic object uh, in the hand. And he asked me if I could do this surgery. And I said, no, I don't do hands, but I can get a general surgeon to do it. So those were the first two cases that uh, we did. And as I said, uh, Skeptical was a conservative uh, uh, consideration. I was doing it for fun to really prove that this was nonsense. But uh, as it turned out, many years later and 16 cases later, we've gone 180 degrees uh, to the point where we have now, without a doubt, the so-called smoking gun physical evidence that the human race has had contact with non-terrestrial civilizations. You know, oh, go on, Preston. Can you describe some of these implants? I mean, you must have, at some point, you must have realized that these, this is something very, very unusual and is the smoking gun. And it seems like you reached that kind of point gradually. And I'm wondering uh, how, how that whole process went along I and mean, when did you first realize that these are really unusual things and uh, 
what well, exactly are they? Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, what was there that uh, that particular moment that occurred where uh, we realized we had something different? Well, actually, there was no uh, instant moment of uh, of revelation that uh, it progressed over a period of time, but it did start, uh, uh, Preston, with the first surgery. Uh, the first object we took out was a T-shaped uh, object that measured about a centimeter in each direction, and it was covered with this very dark gray membrane, and uh, you couldn't cut through it with a surgical blade. Now, surgical blades are pretty sharp. Uh, you can even, uh, either on purpose or accidentally, whittle a bone with one. So uh, not to be able to cut through this material was uh, rather uh, strange. So uh, for the sake of good medical practice, we just set it aside and then went to the other side of the toe and removed this other little cantaloupe seed-shaped device. Now, during the surgery, there were some things that happened that normally don't happen. Because the woman was apprehensive, we used... Hypnotic uh, anesthesia along with a, a local anesthesia to anesthetize the area. Well, at one point, I touched something during the surgery, and the patient came out of the hypnotic state and uh, just kicked her foot off the table, uh, you know, screamed out in pain. Uh, this was very unusual because we'd given her enough anesthesia to uh, anesthetize the leg, more or less the foot or the toe. <laughs> so we re- reinstituted the anesthesia again, both hypnotically and uh, introducing more local, and were able to get the object out. So at that point, we knew there was something that was, let's put it in the category of different. Not extraterrestrial or, or, you know, something mysterious, but different. Doc, then, uh, with your implants, everything that you've removed with hair, uh, nails, every other piece of metal, they had inflammatory response, but this didn't, right? That's correct. But, you know, you're using the naked eye, and when you do these surgeries, you can't really see whether there's an inflammatory response or not, unless it's enclosed in what's called a fibrous inclusion cyst. And if the body, for example, can't expel the object with the infl- with an inflammatory process, then it merely uses fibrous tissue and walls it off, so it kind of separates it from the rest of the tissues of the body, so the reaction slows down to an acceptable point. We saw a lot of that during World War II, where pieces of uh, windshields were shot into uh, pilots and co-pilots and navigators and so on, and uh, they couldn't be removed because they were in precarious places, but they wound up where the patients really didn't have a lot of pain or discomfort with them because later they found out that they were enclosed in these fibrous inclusion cysts. Well, there was no such thing here. Uh, at all so but as far as an inflammatory process we didn't know that at the time of surgery that came later when we'd sent the specimens out and got the pathology report back and that's when you know we did two sides of one toe on one patient and the back of a hand on another patient and these you know out of all the cases that we've done between okay doc we're going to Close on your call, and we're going to try calling you on your landline and see if that works any better. Preston, in the meantime, can you tell us a little bit about this new book that's coming out, UFOs Over Nevada? Preston, you are also coming in, sadly, not very well. Preston, we have you back, right? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Preston, talk to them about your upcoming book real quick. All right. Yeah, I've just uh, recently uh, working, released a book, uh, UFOs Over New Mexico, published by Shipper Books. It's in the style of my uh, two other books about uh, activity over states such as UFOs Over New York and UFOs Over California. UFOs Over New Mexico covers the full range of encounters. turns out New Mexico has a very long history of UFO encounters, stretching back about 100 years, pretty much like all the states. And I'm very excited about the book. It covers not only sightings, but landings and uh, 
UFO crashes. It turns out New Mexico has more cases of UFO crashes than any other state. Um, so, so that's particularly interesting. I think it's because of uh, New Mexico's research into uh, atomics. In fact, if you look at the pattern of sightings over New Mexico, it coincides very closely with the whole atomic era, which is certainly uh, something other researchers have made note of. You know, Preston, I am eagerly awaiting that that UFOs over Nevada book to come out because I think that's got so much there. You know, finally, after five, six decades, we've been talking about, you know, Area 51, and finally the government acknowledges that. Can you tell our listeners about that real quick? Let me get Dr. Lear back on. Doctor. Yeah, sure. I, I was actually shocked. You know, UFOs over Nevada is the next one in the series. And I was real, you know, I thought I knew a lot about Area 51, and uh, certainly everyone's heard of it. It's probably one of the most popular uh, tourist destinations in Nevada. And uh, I know many people have actually gone there and actually seen UFOs. But when I started doing serious research into the subject of Area 51, I found that the story was actually a lot more complicated and in depth than I had ever realized. Um, so I think a lot of people are going to be surprised, you know, what I found out. About what's going on in Area 51, and for me, what I found most amazing was uh, this article in Fate magazine, actually, in which a bunch of people were asked to visit Area 51 psychically, doing a process of remote viewing, or out-of-body experiences, or just clairvoyantly looking in to see what's going on. And uh, what these people found out, you know, a bunch of people wrote in, you know. This was an experiment to see what they would find out. And a bunch of people wrote and described their experiences, and it was shocking how well they matched up. And not only that, it was amazing to hear what these people were saying about what they saw, which corroborates a lot of what we've heard coming out of this from actual... Uh, Hello? I, oh, Preston, guess what? We got Dr. Lear back. I'm sorry to interrupt what you were saying, but it seems like we got these little glitches fixed, and we could continue on. Go... Go ahead, Preston. Uh, pick up where you left off with Dr. Lear. I, you guys were... Dr. Yeah. Lear, yeah, go on. Yeah, I, was, yeah, I, were I think about... we were watching about that moment when we realized that we had something uh, that was uh, a non-terrestrial nature. I was explaining that during the first surgeries, we had some uh, uh, interesting things uh, happen. Uh, but it wasn't until I got the pathology report back where we saw we had no inflammatory reaction, which is uh, almost impossible. And then we had a large number of uh, specialized nerve cells that were surrounding the object in anatomical places where they don't belong. Now, when you see this and you're, you're, you know, have a scientific background, most of what you're concerned about is the fact that uh, it's you as the individual who may be lacking a certain amount of knowledge. So um, that's exactly what I thought was happening. You know, I'd been out of school for 30 some odd years, so maybe there was something new uh, and inflammation that I wasn't aware of. So I did some in-depth research getting into uh, medical school uh, libraries such as Harvard and Stanford and so on. And that's when I began to realize that uh, in-depth research wasn't free. <laughs> you had to uh, you had to pay a fee to use these school libraries and so on. But uh, to make a long story short, uh, there were some new things about inflammation. We knew things about uh, certain hormones like leukokinin and so on that were attracted to the area and what we call macro, macrophage attraction uh, activity and changes of some of the white cells. But really, the basic inflammatory process was as I had originally learned it. So there wasn't a lack of uh, knowledge, but you know something else was going on. Then when we went ahead and did the rest of the surgeries, the, the biological aspect or the pathological aspect kept pretty consistent. So we tried to do, you know, some uh, metallurgical research, but we didn't have any money. We did this, you know, 
like I said, it's a project to have fun and then find, found some unusual findings and then really didn't know where to go with them because we didn't have any money uh, to go you know, directly to a laboratory, a metallurgical laboratory. And even if we did, we didn't know what test to ask or to ask for. We had you know, absolutely no knowledge of this whatsoever. So um, when we had a number of these specimens, uh, I got a call from, at that time, which was the National Institute of Discovery Science, uh, headed by Robert Bigelow uh, from uh, Las Vegas. And we spent a lengthy conversation uh, on the phone with him, a couple of members of his uh, board, and they said that they would get back to me. Uh, well, they did, and they invited me on their time to uh, go to Las Vegas and present this material to uh, their science board, and I agreed to do that. But I was scared to death. I wasn't a researcher. I, you know, I wasn't in there. These were all PhD uh, scientists of the highest caliber, like Jacques Vallée and, and you know, and John Alexander and dozens, dozens of other people. So uh, uh, somehow I I got enough uh, courage to agree, and I went and I made the presentation. Well, what happened was that. Uh, half of the board started asking me questions that were so scientific in nature, I couldn't answer them. Uh, but uh, to my surprise, the other half of the board took up on my behalf and answered the questions for the other members of the board. So it was quite a meeting, quite an experience, one which I'll never forget. Uh, Bob Bigelow is a, is a wonderful man. Uh, he's just a very, very dear soul um, and uh, an extremely uh, good person, wonderful scientist, excellent thinker, and very successful. And I wish him a lot of continuing luck with his uh, uh, space venture. But uh, at, that, at the end of the meeting, he, we agreed that he took uh, six uh, specimens and uh, sent them out to, for uh, in-depth metallurgical research to you know, laboratories like the Los Alamos National Labs and New Mexico Tech. And uh, the minute the data get, got back, he sent me a complete a book-like copy of the data. But at the end, there was no report. Dr. So, Lear, do you know wh why Mr. Bigelow had a what had fascination he had about this because he funded a great endeavor to get your information out there. And, you know, there was actually a show on conspiracy theory with Jesse Ventura that talked about Bigelow. And at the very end, Sean Stone asks him and he said he had a fascination with the subject going back. How did that kind of happen? Well, I think uh, that he has a deep, deep, deep personal interest in uh, space and uh, life outside of this planet. <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me, maybe it was due to uh, something personal or whatever, but <laughs> it's engendered a drive in it, which uh, continues to this day, uh, henceforth Bigelow Aerospace. But um, as I said, it was, it was fortunate that he did take this interest uh, because I wouldn't have gotten, you know, uh, where we were, where we are today, uh, without his help. Well, when I got enough data, you know, as I said, he was it was his time. He was paying for this for these reports. Didn't get a report, and he was extremely irritated. So um, he went back to Los Alamos and New Mexico Tech, and they did produce a report. And they said that the only thing they could compare these objects to were meteorite samples. Well, we know that. Somebody didn't step on a meteorite or, you know, whack the back of their hand with a meteorite. And in any, in any of the cases that we did, there was no scar, there was no portal of entry, there was no way it could have gotten in there, which was added to the mystery. Uh, but we did start coming up with some metallurgical data, and then we went up from there and... Uh, I formed a non-profit uh, organization, ANS Research, and uh, we got scientists uh, to come aboard. <laughs> uh, excuse me. And uh, started our own scientific endeavor so we could produce some in-house science and 
So I had to learn, believe me, uh, I knew nothing about the field of metallurgy, but in order to understand what these guys were talking about, I had to learn and uh, sat down with the uh, uh, books and, you know, uh, figure out what uh, uh, non-terrestrial isotopes meant and, you know, what uh, uh, meteoric iron was and uh, a lot of other things that had to do with it. What's amazing, amazing, Roger, is that you're doing such pioneering work here, and there really isn't a guidebook on how to study um, these implants. So my question is, what do you think these implants are? I mean, do you have any idea of their purpose, or have the abductees told you anything about what they think they might be? Well... You know, uh, speaking scientifically uh, again, and uh, you mentioned at the, at the top of the show that uh, you know th- this wasn't my knowledge. I, I more compare myself to a plumber <laughs> than uh, than anything else. I mean, you have a uh, stopped up drain, and the plumber comes out and he takes the junk out of your drain. Well, he isn't he isn't responsible for the analysis of uh, you know what's down there. Uh, so the same thing with me. I mean, I'm the, the hands that removes the object, uh, and we set up a strict set of criteria and protocols to tie it to the abduction phenomena. But in answer to your question, it's okay to uh, scientifically theorize, and that's uh, what we've done. Now, we know that uh, that area of abduction phenomena all over the world. I've been in 42 countries in seven years. We know that it's basically all has uh, mainly one thing in common, and that is the taking of ova and sperm. Well, I've said this many times. I don't think that whoever's ever taking this material uh, is part of the cooking channel. Uh, they're not making omelets with it, you know. Where, uh, <laughs> obviously, there's something genetic going on. So it looks to me, uh, and again, I did a study on 17 functional growth characteristics in children over a period of 40 years and found that they've been accelerated from 16 to 86%. Now, that's a, a lot of acceleration of these growth character characteristics over a period of 40 years. So we can't, you can't say that evolution or even fast evolution. And, you know, and then when you look at the possibilities, let's look at environmental change, for example, with the uh, increased amount of uh, high energy particles coming from the sun producing mutations as a human viruses and bacteria. Well, if that was the case, I mean, we find a lot of babies born with a blue eye and, and uh, a black eye or a red eye or, uh, you know, six, six fingers on one hand and four on the other or but we don't. We don't see that. Instead, we see very specific accelerations and things like when a child can uh, first raise its head, stand in a, in a crib, uh, take a first few steps, uh, stair climb, first age of simple speech, or first age of complex speech. And then you, then you look at what a child says if you really listen. And I've had this conversation with mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers all over the world. It's the same. Uh, if you really listen to what they have said to say, they, they have a built-in sense of knowledge that uh, they're not getting out of books and they're not getting off the TV. They seem to be tuned in, you know. These these are the kids that, you know, now are 30 or 35 years of old, of age. And here they fulminated a revolutionary war starting in Egypt, which spread all through the Middle East through the means of the electronics. Uh, I went to a museum in Philadelphia where they had a Leonardo da Vinci exhibit. And the museum had uh, taken the time and money to actually build the models that Leonardo da Vinci designed. And they built them out of wood. And in a room, an adjoining room, were these pedestal-type computers in which kids, uh, maybe six, seven, eight, nine years of age, were using these computers with their parents standing there. And as you see on CSI or uh, Hawaii Five-O, flipping these um, 
menus uh, and pictures onto virtual screens and actually building these objects that the museum had built, Leonardo da Vinci's designs, with the parents standing there, young parents, scratching their heads. So are we undergoing uh, a change? Is the human race changing? And if, if the theory is correct, I want to find out what the, um, what the uh, results, what the scientific results are of your manipulation. Uh, you don't have to come back and re-abduct everybody again. You merely have to uh, tag them like, we do with with bears and whales, and you only do about fifteen percent uh, before you can make a logical statement that you know during the hibernation of a bear they uh, consume so much food, their respiratory rate, and so on and so on. Uh, and we always remember that when John went into space, he complained on national TV that he had to swallow what implants. Because the mission control had to know stuff about the physiology in space. So that's based on our logic, John and, and Preston. But, you know, how could we possibly even have the audacity to assume that a civilization that's a thousand or a million years older than we are, even using any portion of what is related to our homo sapien logic, you know, uh, Doc, so, I completely agree with what you say. Uh, just like with Stan Friedman said, with the steady, silly effort to investigate, we're sending out those radio waves. Why are we have the arrogance to assume that we're going to get replies with radio waves when a civilization, like you said, that could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions, if not a billion years ahead of us, would be using the same technology we are? Yeah, well, they may be oh, more advanced I've... than us, but, uh, you know, the, for some reason they are interested in us. I mean, that, uh, I think that's very clear that, that so many people are being abducted and having these experiences shows that these ETs, whoever they are and whatever their agenda is, they're really profoundly interested in us. Well, I think, yes, uh, whoever is doing this is interested uh, in us, and not for altruistic reasons that they're trying to make better humans. But, you know, in order to uh, understand the present, in order to understand the future, you must have some understanding of the past. And that's what most people don't bother to take the time to learn. It's there. It's in the books. It's, in, it's on the Internet. You know, if you read Zachariah Sitchin's you know, set of books, uh, the Earth Chronicle, you know, if, if you read the ancient literature, and you get an understanding of what mankind was and where it came from, and don't cloud it with uh, other theories, such as the theistic approach to, uh, you know, we, we were made by a god in the image of a god, which is the Bible or any of the other literature doesn't say that. So if you have an understanding of where we came from, then maybe you have an understanding of where we're going. I think that we've reached a state in our development where we become probably dangerous, not only to ourselves, but probably to the universe. So, you know, going back to Gene Roddenberry's non, non interference, uh, uh, agreement, uh, you know, how do you go about solving this problem if you were responsible for us in the first place? You'd have to go back to where you started with and re, re manipulate the human genome. And I asked for a theory. Well, that's what I think is, is going on. And there was a, a term that was coined some years ago by John Blake in Connecticut. And uh, he called the, the new humans uh, uh, Homo noeticus. And that means uh, basically new humans. So that's, you know, leave it to us to solve our own problems. But you give us a, a different genome to solve it so that we don't uh, destroy the Earth and release atomic energy. And to this day, you know, the release of atomic energy either underground or in the atmosphere releases a magnetic wave, with no, which nobody seems to bother to talk about except some of the physicists, and it travels out to space. Well, we don't know where it goes or what it does. 
but maybe that's not such a good thing. You know, Doc, I keep saying that you have the smoking gun in your hand, which I truly believe you do. So when we had Stan Romanek on a couple of weeks ago, he talked about his implant. He actually said he possibly had up to three uh, in him, but one of them was removed. I guess it was protruding near his, outside of his skin, near his stomach, and it just came out, and it immediately started reacting with the air. But he has... I believe it's probably from electron microscope, but I'm assuming. And it shows virus size gears and possibly virus size or single cell size uh, microchips. Would you say that you found the exact same things on your implants? No. Uh, we don't find anything that, uh, as far as academic science is concerned, is uh, within the realm of uh, human science. Um, these things are nanotechnological, highly sophisticated uh, devices that uh, emit uh, not only electromagnetic fields, but also, in certain instances, uh, radio waves, which is quite a conundrum because, uh, as we pointed out, what advanced civilization is going to be dealing with a radio wave? So there's only two possibilities. <laughs> Well, number one is that there's a deal that has been made so that somebody is piggybacking on these radio waves and getting the data also in, in our human existence, uh, or that they are we're dealing with is a completely different electromagnetic spectrum where we're using scalar wave technology, and the scalar waves are producing a harmonic, which we read as a radio wave. But it, 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 peculiarly enough, uh, if that were the case, uh, I have evidence to show that the frequencies that we find are deep space uh, fixed or mobile frequencies. So, um, you know, you, you know what you are saying. Doc, what you were saying about the piggybacking, you know, it fits perfectly with uh, Preston in a, a book that he wrote, UFOs Over California. He has an entire chapter devoted to the Eisenhower meeting. And in that mm -hmm. meeting, they talk about this treaty that they had where we, they could abduct a certain amount of number of humans and that they have to report to those people to the White House. Do you think maybe that's what the piggybacking of the radio signals is so that the intelligence community and you know maybe whoever was behind that treaty on the human side is also getting the information that these extraterrestrials are getting from it no i think it's a consideration that we have to look at that may be based in some actual reality but you know we really don't know how many groups are visiting here the, the entities that crashed in Brazil, they were not described uh, anywhere else by any abductees. Uh, they weren't wearing any, any clothes. Uh, it doesn't look like they had any intention of landing here uh, at all. And with the, the object that went down, uh, the, the farmer who originally saw it, uh, said that there was a piece that was missing out of what he called the tail end of it and it was trailing vapor or smoke. Now, you, you combine that with the fact that NORAD uh, from the United States had notified the Brazilian Space Agency that this object was coming down from space and gave them the exact coordinates and time uh, where it was coming down. I mean, it's a little bit suspicious when you see a craft trying to fly around and there's a piece missing out of it and it's smoking. I mean, what does that tell you? You know, it sounds like they they shot him down. Yeah, well, that's what it sounds like to me. So again, we don't know how many uh, how many entities from somewhere else uh, are were visiting here back in the days of uh, uh, Robert Dean when he was at Shape Command headquarters in Europe. I think he talked about the assessment, saying there was either twelve or fourteen different races. Well, my God. That was years and years and years ago. And then the, the look at the Betty Hill the star map with the lines going between trade routes. We were so far off of the trade route. You know, why would anybody want to come here in the first place? 
So, but, but we've changed now. You know, back in the in Betty and Barney Hill day, we weren't doing what we're doing. We're not burning the rainforest. We're not releasing atomic energy. We don't. We don't have uh, plants that are uh, atomic plants that are uh, imploding and releasing radiation into the environment. So uh, things have changed. You know how you were saying that. Bob Dean had said that there was a few 12 to 14 different entities. Well, Clifford Stone, when he left, I think it was, what, 88, 89, around there, he said there was, I think, 57 different species. Well, a couple months ago, we had Carrie Cassidy on, who has a lot of whistleblowers that she's interviewed. She said the estimates now can be as high as 250 different species. What do you think about that? Oh, well, based on, again, science and our own new astronomical knowledge, I mean, it was pretty exciting when they announced that they had found uh, six, uh, you know, extraterrestrial or exoplanets uh, orbiting the sun. And then it got even more exciting when they said they found 27. And then it got even more exciting when they found uh, uh, over 1,000. And now I understand they're talking about numbers around 27,000 with a certain amount of them being in the so-called Goldilocks zone. And, <laughs> you know, they're not that far away. So it seems to be more and more and more, if we're looking for uh, extraplanetary life on exoplanets, not saying that these entities are coming from another planet, Within our uh, within our portion of the universe, or from this universe at all, uh, there, you know the multiverse theory uh, still holds water. Nobody's blown that up yet. Uh, and then there's the non you know, extra dimensional theory, where you can have uh, more than one existence going on at the same time, according to Einstein, or at different times. So it gets very, very complex, and then we start talking about how many entities are visiting here or where they may be coming from. Uh, You're talking about some phenomenal uh, numbers. But I think we got interested. I think we started interesting uh, non-terrestrial entities uh, at the beginning of the attack age. Because even even today... That yeah, when we launched the atomic bomb, it basically set off uh, a nuclear reaction that's like a domino, a chain, a, a domino chain that never ends. So we basically gave an open invitation to the universe saying we are now an atomic civilization. And that coincides with so many UFOs starting to come in and watching us, which well, wouldn't you agree that that's probably what brought them back in 47 or 44 as opposed to them coming for thousands of years and why all of a sudden we were rushed with so many different species and so many different in such a short time? Oh, I would say that's a good possibility because even today, the highest concentrations of UFO sightings are in areas where there are uranium mining activities going on. Can you call, can you, all those people, the debunkers who are going to say that the actual implants are meteorites, either they're going to try to dismiss this as simply meteorites. I know we talked about this a little last hour, but can you set the record straight and tell them why it's not? Well, if they say these things are meteorites, I mean, they're, they're talking like uh, kindergarten children because how are you going to get hit with a meteorite and not have a scar? You know, and how are you going to get the meteorite in your body without having a scar? How is that is a meteorite in any way going to have an effect on the physiology of the body or communicate or put out radio signals? I mean, more, that, would, more than that. that would be that would be so absurd in making that statement. Uh, you know, I used to say that the skeptics were psychics because uh, they didn't like that. But you know, I mean, they seem to know everything about what you're doing, but they never look at any of the data. You know, and well, besides that, don't, don't. As I said, I'm the plumber, so don't bother talking to me or criticize me. Talk to the scientists that are involved. You know, talk to to Bob Bigelow. Talk, you know, talk to people from A and S Research. 
You know, you're so right when you say these skeptics act like psychics because they do have answers for everything without even looking at the data. They just seem to know what the answer is without anything. Can you – you had a little incident where you had the book that the skeptics use which basically dismisses everything. Can we talk a little bit about that? And if it's okay with you, can we talk a bit about a little what happened with the History Channel? Well, yes, I did a program which shall go unnamed, uh, but uh, <laughs> we gave them uh, a, a specimen, which was a portion of one of the uh, implant uh, <laughs> specimen materials, and uh, they wanted it. Um, they wanted it, me to take it to a place where I could have an exact piece cut to their specifications. So uh, I did that, and it was a rectangle uh, certain measurement. And I found out the only place I could have this done was a lapidary. So I went to a lapidary, and we cut this thing exactly the way I wanted it. So uh, the essence of the show was they showed certain things which uh, they were able to prove uh, negative, or sort of, you know, that they weren't what they thought they were certain things that couldn't make up their mind and certain things which were uh, positive and so on. Uh, so this this was one of the three. We'll come to find out that at the end of the show, the uh, position they took on this object was uh, negative. In other words, it wasn't what it was shown to me. So um, I was kind of taken aback uh, about that, and uh, I had my uh, agent... Uh, get in touch with them and they found out that they had sent it to a uh, fairly well respected scientist at uh, an unnamed university uh, with uh, a lot of um, rep- uh, a good reputation science department and uh, I, I got the name of the scientist and I called him and I, I said well, he said well I hope you're not upset about the result of the examination of the material that they showed on on TV. I said, no. I said, you seem to be, you know, a certainly reputable science, and I'm sure you did your homework and you reached that particular conclusion. But I was just wondering, oh, you know, some of the findings and so on. And he says, well, I hope you didn't mind. I just cut the little corner off the triangle. And I said, triangle? What? what triangle are you talking about? And he says, oh, a triangular piece of metal you sent me. And I said, but I didn't send you a triangular piece of metal. I sent you a rectangle of certain dimensions, which I gave him. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I received. So, uh, again, I got a hold of my agent, and uh, I went, and, oh, <laughs> I should add this, that finally... A few weeks after the show aired, they sent me material back, but they made a heck of a mistake because the piece that they supposed to have sent me back was a triangle, but that wasn't what I gave them. They switched it, and uh, so I had my agent call at that time um, the company and talk to the producer, and uh, their answer was simply, uh, oh, we don't care putting a different terminology. Wow. So would you take that evidence of an actual uh, c- cover-up of, you know, what your findings? No. Or, uh, it or wasn't was a cover-up. It, it was... Uh, I, I did... Uh, John has seen the film I did, which we're trying trying to get it, you know, legally so we can uh, sell it and air it. But uh, when, you, when you go into Hollywood and, you know, you look at all these things... Uh, you know, and it has to do with um, the UFO phenomena. I know we're skeptics and the bunkers and lies and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and but when you talk about even subjects like ghosts, you don't see them. And, and there's been no films, uh, nothing released in video or DVD from from Hollywood or anywhere else that I know of that has the bunkers debunking God. You know, you just don't see that. So we went kind of in and did an in-depth behind-the-scenes research project. And what we came out with was very simple. Uh, You're dealing with the entertainment business. 
they couldn't care less whether they're putting on something that uh, has basis in reality or doesn't, as long as it's entertaining and it makes money. It's very oh. simple. It's quite simplistic. It's a shame because uh, this is a serious subject. Now, one question I wanted to ask you is um, regarding going back to these implants: is uh, have you found any pattern of who is actually putting these implants in people and playing the devil's advocate? I don't believe this to be true. Is it possible that some of these implants were done by government people or humans? Well, you can eliminate government because uh, of several factors. One is that I've been, <clears throat> fortunately or unfortunately, in black budget laboratories. And uh, when you find a bunch of scientists that are crowded into a room looking at this stuff under the electron microscope, and the director is standing out in the hall with a hand on each hip because these guys are on a government payroll, and uh, he's mattered in hell. You know damn well that the black budget people don't have this. Uh, another reason is I've had some dealings with um, a company recently, a very large one that, that does black budget work for the uh, government, but it's only about 20%. And 70% of their work is done for commercial development of advanced technology that's run more like a university. And uh, they told me, don't bring us a project that's uh, 10 years in the future. Don't bring us a project that's 100 years in the future. <laughs> if you bring us a project that's 1,000 years in the future, we'll take a look at your data. If we like it, we'll sponsor it. And you can stay there and work, and we'll pay you for six months. Then they reevaluate your data, and if it still looks good, then you could be there another six months, a year, two, or three years until they develop it into something that's commercially marketable. <laughs> so we know that this this material <laughs> is not something that's being done by black budget science, which those who deal with black budget science say it could be as, uh, at least a hundred years ahead of academic science. And relative to the to the the objects uh, themselves and where they come from, uh, we have a scientist, very well respected nuclear physicist, which is on our board, Dr. Robert Kuntz, and he's uh, looked at the isotopic ratios in these objects and determined that the and he bases his calculations on the Big Bang, <laughs> and to get the isotopes that we find in these objects. It's convertible through a constant into a galactic distance. And he said they come from at least one-third away across the Milky Way galaxy and probably from a civilization that's at least a million years older than we are. So, so do you have any idea who, I mean, are these being implants from abductees who have seen greys? Um, well, when... When abductees talk about seeing greys, and when we look at the Combergus footage, which I was there while I was being shot in Turkey, and you see greys that are in the front of operating a craft, I mean, you know that greys involved, but who are greys? I mean, you know, we, we look at uh, people from uh, China, uh, Korea, uh, other, you know, various parts of the Orient, and to us, they all look oriental. So I can say we're going to group all the Orientals into one bag. I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe there's greys from, you know, different different uh, portions of the universe or the multiverse. Or Doctor Lear, do you remember in '74 Sagan sent out a binary code basically describing where we're located in our galaxy? Yeah. that were carbon based and all that and what our size is and we occupy the third planet from the sun in our solar system when we received back a signal I think it was in 2001 2004 I'm a right. little bit unsure crop circle. yes the crop circle stated that they occupy three, occupy three planets in the zeta reticular star system so mm -hmm. wouldn't that fit perfectly with the greys looking a little maybe the tall ones, the short ones, the skinny ones, because that's just three planets right there, and maybe they evolved a little bit differently, or I don't know if they started on one planet, moved to the other, but that just fits in perfectly with what other people are saying. Everything well, ties in. Yeah, it does, and if you look at, you know, it depends on who you believe and who you think is credible and who's non-credible and blah, 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 but uh, people like Dan Burrish, 
who I had grave doubts as to his impossible authenticity. And so I met him, and he invited me to a lecture at Caltech. Well, come to find out, you know, John, as a legal person, <laughs> you can't walk off the street and lecture at Caltech. And I did some research on what you have to do to lecture at Caltech, and uh, you can't just walk off of the street and walk in there. <laughs> it's quite a process you got to go through. So I was very impressed with that, and the fact that when he was introduced by uh, an Indian uh, professor of physics, uh, the first thing that uh, was said was, I'd like to thank the United States Department of Defense and Dr. Dan Burrish for appearing here today. And uh, this, this was all filmed, and uh, you know, I was impressed. And then he volunteered to uh, actually help me uh, do some research. So I gave him some uh, material, and uh, within a month I got a report back. That was probably the finest piece of, uh, of, of scientific investigation that I've had turn out. I would say it was even better than what Los Alamos or New Mexico Tech produced. You know, when Bob Lazar came out in the late 80s, and he was received with a lot of ridicule, but I believed him, and then they said, they couldn't find his record. They couldn't find this. Well, George Knapp uncovered a Los Alamos directory with him in it, which obviously, if you work at Los Alamos, you obviously, as a scientist, not a janitor, you more than presumably have a decent degree from a good place. And this just goes to show how easy it is for them to cover it up. But when Dan Burrish came out, he actually was able to corroborate a lot of Bob Lazar's story and, of course, expand on it with the work that he did with the J-Rod in S4. And I think that they both corroborated each other, and that's what I think makes Mr. Burst or Dr. Burst very credible. I saw one of his, several of his interviews, hours combined. He goes into serious detail of everything he works in. I honestly think he's the real McCoy as well. Oh, I spent some time initially with him because, as I said, I had no faith in the story whatsoever. And I kind of buttonholed him at a conference, and he invited me backstage, and I asked him very specific medical questions. And he was right on. I mean, he was absolutely exacting. There was hems, haws, or butts about the answer. But uh, I want to return this to the subject of the grays. So the J-Rods were grays. Uh, Bob Lazar talked about grays at, at Area 51. So are they the same grays? Now, now Burris says the grays are us in the distant future. You know, who knows, for example, whether the civilization that was on Mars before their uh, astronomical calamity occurred were not us in, in the form of greys. Yeah, so, you're right. He says that the, the crash in Roswell was actually the greys where we, we involved of living underground for 52,000 years as basically with bigger heads because of our higher intellect – large eyes to see in dark circumstances and smaller body because the technology didn't need we didn't need so much manual labor in the sense and he said the reason why there was a discrepancy with the nordics and the grays is the ones that stayed above ground and kept the human features versus the ones that went below ground and then went to the moon and then the mars and then to the reticuli i think just kind of fits if, if we took humans, put them underground 50,000 years later. Wouldn't you think that they would look a little bit like that? I think it, in some ways it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. There's, there's a rationale for that. Plus the fact that uh, how do we know, uh, looking at the vastness of the universe, and if uh, civilizations reside on planets uh, such as ours, how many of them are really surface dwellers and how many of them are subterranean dwellers? Because if you look at the, the, the planetary geology and planets are in a constant state of flux with the mantle moving and those that have, uh, have iron cores, uh, you know, that cause, uh, uh, changes in, um, you know, the molten plasticity of the tectonic plates. Um, maybe it's a lot safer to live uh, underground than it is on the surface. So I wouldn't be a bit surprised if uh, there was a lot more subsurface dwellers than there are surface dwellers. Roger, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, you know, your books are amazing, Alien Implants and The Alien Scapel, but uh, I have to tell you, your book, UFO Crash in Brazil, is also 
really an incredible piece of uh, research. And uh, you're a rare bird. You're, you know, and someone with scientific training who does more than you know armchair research actually goes out into the field and does first-hand interviews and does real research. And I'd love to hear about your uh, research into the UFO crash in Brazil. Well, that was uh, a case that uh, happened uh, fairly recently in 1996, very much like uh, Roswell, except with the Roswell case, there was uh, more emphasis placed on the crash of a vehicle or vehicles. <laughs> Incidentally, there's new information on that that's uh, out on the Internet uh, the last two days. As far as I know, um, it was Bruce Maccabee, who was able to get a FOIA document uh, from the FBI, of all places, uh, dated 19, I believe, 51, that stated there were three crashes in Roswell. There was more emphasis placed on the uh, on the crash of the vehicle or vehicles than uh, in the Roswell case. But in Parchenia, there was more emphasis placed on the occupants who were seen uh, around town following the crash, and it involved uh, the three branches of the military. One was the Brazilian Army. The other was the fire department, which in Brazil is a military unit. And the third was the military police, police which is a separate uh, unit. But uh, the extent of the research that I did down there, uh, when I <laughs> when I arrived in Virginia, which is only maybe about 130,000 people. It's a small agricultural town in the state of Minas Gerais, which is in northern Brazil. Uh, the bottom portion, the state of the southern portion of the state is very lush with uh, agriculture, and the northern part, portion of the state is where all the jewels, all the uh, precious uh, stones come from. So it's a very, it's a state with varying terrain from, you know, lush growth to uh, areas which get little or no rainfall. It was almost gray. Um, but the incident occurred in the southern part of the state, as I said, the cultural area. But the plane landed, and uh, I was with uh, a couple of other people who were there to uh, document this and do a filming. <laughs> and uh, we were met uh, coming down the stairs of the plane by a group of people, uh, one of which uh, spoke fluent English and introduced me to the mayor of Brazil, or the mayor of Virginia. Wow. <laughs> and and uh, I was absolutely flabbergasted that a mayor of any place <laughs> would want to come out and meet me. So uh, he did, and they they treated me like I was a, a political uh, a potentate from somewhere, gathering my bags, uh, rushed us in a limo to the hotel, and I had dinner that night, and then the following day uh, we started our investigation, and some witnesses uh, came forth because, only because they knew I was a doctor, not because they wanted to uh, give testimony to the case, but... Because I was a doctor, and they hold positions in higher esteem there, uh, unfortunately, more than they are here today. But, Doc, um, I got an important question to ask you. You know, you sit on 16 smoking guns, right? And we've known that for 15 years, 17 or 18 now, the media has had every opportunity to come and touch on this subject, yet they haven't. And obviously because of some censorship, we're worrying about that it's not going to be released in the U.S. Do you think if Brazil discloses that this will force the U.S. to disclose? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the purpose of, uh, you know, the meetings that we have at uh, Just Cause with the ET Media Group is to try and get uh, number one Hollywood to start producing films which are more realistically based on the UFO subject instead of these uh, monster films where everybody gets uh, eaten up and they spend uh, two or three hundred million dollars and wind up losing two hundred million. Uh, but Steve uh, Bassett, who has this up, said that uh, you know, a mistake was uh, recently made by Obama, and uh, he's going to use it. And that was Obama was asked you know, whether we've had any uh, extraterrestrial contact, and he said absolutely not. 
that, you know, we don't know of any life anywhere else in the universe, extraterrestrial life, and none has ever visited here. So Steve says it's like uh, a big chess game. Now we're going to use that and uh, hit him over the head with it, so to speak. You know, I hope to God that it wakes people up finally and this disclosure will actually start to happen. And it seems from what you told me that Brazil is far more receptive. The civilians and the people who live there, the citizens, don't have the doubts that the U.S. citizens have. The mayor wanted to meet you because he knows how important of a figure you are. The people in the Virginia, Virginia Brazil crash were eager to speak to you and then do you think it was the u.s that covered up their crash uh, how did that work out oh, well uh let me tell you <laughs> i'll be out with a new book in a couple of months and i go uh, again back to the virginia case and i talk about what's happened within the last year and uh, there's some very strange things that have happened which you can only say that it happened by design because of uh, probably external influence over uh, the Brazil, uh, Brazil populations. But you got to remember that the situation is different in Brazil than it is here. In the first place, Brazil is now energy independent. It doesn't need anything from anywhere or any other country. In fact, it's supplying other countries. Uh, whether it's oil or ethanol or whatever, uh, it's, it's a country which grows you know, non-GMO crops. The food is absolutely excellent. Their standard of living, although it's a four-tiered standard of living, is still pretty good for the average person. So uh, they're a bit of a renegade. It's one of the few places in the world where you can pick up a, a guidebook and they'll tell you where to go see UFOs. If anything UFO-wise happens, it appears in the paper, uh, in the newspapers. It's not not like here. So if Brazil was a, a country that would be disclosed, um, there would have quite a few ramifications because I have uh, documents that were signed between uh, when Golden was the head of uh, NASA with the Brazilian Space Agency said that all material... Uh, non-terrestrial material coming from Brazil would be turned over to the United States, but that, that the United States would 50-50 with the commercial development of this with Brazil. Well, what happened was they never did. And I think that the, one of the indications, one of the Brazilian responses was the calling of uh, A.J. Javard and four or five other noted uh, UFO researchers uh, to Brasilia, and I had the meeting with the Brazilian Air Force, and they released over 2,000 documents. <laughs> now, I have those 2,000 documents, and they are absolutely fantastic uh, drawings and, and, and photos of uh, uh, stuff that has been going on in Brazil. But AJ said that's the top of the iceberg. But uh, the Barquinha case, as I said, uh, you know, there was some great stuff that. Uh, of world interest that went on there that, you know, you can still find it on the internet. But I interviewed uh, the three girls who were witnesses to one of the ETs. I interviewed their uh, mother, grandmother. I interviewed the wife of the uh, deceased military police officer, a young fellow who was about 25 years of age with the name of Marco Eli Chavese. Uh, he had uh, saw uh, one of these ETs trying to cross the street, realized that he was injured, uh, went over to him. He gave no resistance. He guided him back to another very small vehicle with one other driver and put him on his lap. No protective gear, no, no face mask, no gloves, no nothing. He put him on his lap and they took him to a first aid station. And the first aid station in Brazil is very primitive. They said they're basically not even set up to treat an animal, more or less a human being, they're for very minor things. And from there, they went to a hospital called Hospital Janal, which is in the city of Varginia. And there, there was a large contingent of military, but they didn't think that was unusual either because 
uh, there was a base that was nearby, and whenever there was an accident or a medical uh, urgency, they came in large numbers to the hospital. But uh, to make a long story short, this ET was forced to, uh, well, I should say an orthopedic surgeon on the staff was forced to operate on a fractured leg on this ET. I interviewed him also, and uh, it was just in the book UFO Crash in Brazil, quite quite an emotional uh, situation. Doctor, do you know how many crash and retrievals there, there have been in Brazil? I know there's been a few. There may have been more. I don't know how many of them were done by the uh, Brazilian authorities, but I do know that all the material from the uh, Virginia case was eventually taken to uh, Sao Paulo and loaded on to um, a C-5 uh, U.S. Uh, military transport plane and taken back to an uh, unknown area in the United States. But as to whether they've done their own crash retrievals, um, I suspect that they probably have. There's a lot of things about Brazil that uh, are not made public knowledge. There's probably more pyramids in Brazil than there is uh, certainly in Giza, Egypt, uh, or in Central America. And these uh, pyramids, uh, one of them is larger than Cheops. But they're they're well guarded by the Brazilian government. No one is allowed in there. Uh, they're covered with vegetation. They've never been excavated. So there's a long history of um, ancient uh, artifacts that are in Brazil, as there is in Peru and some of the other South American countries. Any research into you know not only the Brazil crash but alien implants? Did you ever receive any? Uh, interference from, I, I'm going to say government or whoever is, you know, actively covering this stuff up and holding the wreckage of the, of the bodies and well, so on? The only one I had was uh, locally within the state of California where I I came out with my first book, whatever year that was, and uh, the, the medical board uh trumped up a case against me with a patient who was had been deceased for 10 years. And uh, his, he died of some other causes. And I had done a, <laughs> performed a surgery on him, and he came down with a post-op infection and was responding well. And he got into the hands of uh, another doctor who put him in the hospital. And um, he wound up, I think, with an amputation. But... Uh, Ten years went by, and I think he died of a heart attack or something else. And uh, they went back and trumped up a case for me. But when I went to the office and uh, the guy left the room, I kind of rummaged through his desk with pencil and <laughs> guess what was laying on his desk? <laughs> with a copy what? of my book. So. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I had to do my, my penance and... Uh, you know, they, the only time they came back to me after that was that, uh, the use of the word doctor. They didn't like me using doctor because I could be confused with a general physician. So I didn't put the qualifier, you know, but that had nothing to do with me. I, I've done, you know, a few thousand hours of radio and at least a thousand hours of television. <laughs> and they refer to you however they want to refer to you, so... It's not under my control at all. You know, Doc, I had two things I wanted to say. With First, you've you heard about that case that happened in, Earth, I think it was the early 70s, in Mexico. Apparently, there was something coming from space, just like with this Brazil crash, where NORAD found this object and assumed it was going to Mexico, possibly Texas. And then they alerted the Mexican authorities. Apparently it crashed into a civilian plane. The Mexicans said nothing happened. We decided as the government, we, the U S the government decided to send a force down in there anyway, a crash and retrieval team. When they got there, they found all the bodies dead. You recall that case? Yeah. I think that's, uh, was that the Aztec case? Chihuahua, if I'm not mistaken. Chihuahua, yeah. Yeah. And that fits in a little line. I, they, I drew a little similarity with this Brazil case because the people died with exposure to these beings, right? 
Well, there's several stories about that. Um, some say they were murdered on the spot. Uh, well, we do know, according from what A.J. Gavard was able to talk when he talked about these colonel, I don't remember what his last name was, but the colonel that was in charge of Project Saucer when there was this invasion of these uh, over a few month period where these objects kept coming in in this little island uh, off of Brazil and they oh, were that's the 19 I think 57 case on the island of Colares yes that's the, the one what's called the, the Chupa Chupa case that's the one and uh, that guy you know they said he was found after he uh, just not too long after he gave the interview to AJ Hart he actually was found dead of Suicide, they say, but many of us question whether it was suicide or looked. No, it was. It was definitely suicide. Oh, he had, he had become, uh, and it wasn't exactly right after he had retired from the military, and it was several years later. But he obviously couldn't cope with what happened to him, and evidently, not his close friends not believing his story. He became very, uh, very depressed, and it was definitely uh, a suicide. It's much, you know, a lot of things happen to abductees, which result in suicide, alcoholism, uh, drug, narcotics. Uh, uh, they can find the mental institutions because they can't handle it. Well, yeah. that brings up a question: Is how do uh, patients react when they find out they actually have these? implants in them that are not natural and appear to be, you know, actual, I mean, this is smoking gum proof, particularly for them since they're going through it. Well, it places act. them in a, in a very uh, precarious psychological position, uh, you know, and that's why we, we uh, they're, they're psychologically examined before we do any surgery. We want to know whether they're stable, and then we ask them, you know, are you sure you, you want this out? Because, uh, you know, if, if it is uh, proof, uh, you know, that you were handled by extraterrestrials, you know, you're going to have to live with that. Uh, many of them will oscillate back and forth saying, oh, that's nonsense. I just had bad dreams. Uh, oh, yeah, there's something in there, but I must have gotten it in, you know, when I was a child and didn't remember. And then they get through life. Well, those individuals really shouldn't be operated on because I always tell them that, their life could be worse afterward than it was before. But the ones that we have removed objects from, uh, to, we've had two of them tell us almost, or tell the psychologists almost exactly the same thing, that they had newfound feeling of freedom. And uh, physiologically, we've had most of them feel better with the object gone than when it was there. We had one case of a military intelligence officer that uh, uh, weighed about 200 and some odd pounds when he entered the military, and then he blamed the military for exposing him to some ET technology, <laughs> wound up with an implanted device, and when he was discharged from the military, he weighed 80 pounds. That was in very poor health. Well, after the object was removed, he started to gain weight and uh, felt better. So... Um, you know, they, we, we've seen, we've never seen anybody worse off uh, following an extraction than uh, they were before. Dr. Lear, have you had anybody that you've removed an implant come to you and say that they were taken again and another implant has been inserted? Well, we've had uh, a large percentage of them that are continually abducted, but far there's been no further sign of re-implantation which I find very unusual because you know I was asked uh, many times who else in the world is doing what you do and I can't answer that I, I don't know of anybody that's doing and I did before I ever started doing this even though I thought it was uh, you know, a comedic joke I wanted to see you know if anybody else had done anything like this and I looked through the literature and there had been people who had taken things out and they turned to powder disappeared or whatever uh, Whitley Strieber uh, years before uh, I got involved in the field was 
operated on by a Dr. Lerma in, in Texas because he had an implant in his ear. And he opened it up and uh, grabbed a whole little piece of it and was able to get it. But the rest of it moved out of the way, and he got so scared that he just uh, took suture, which you know, closed it up. So that's it, buddy. I don't want any more to do with this. So uh, yeah, I've was, had a lot yeah. of abductees tell me that they've gone to doctors and the doctors have become very upset when the abductees tell them, well, no, I haven't had surgery because the doctor is pointing to, you know, various scars or, you know, even objects in their body and uh, cannot explain them. So this is a challenge, I think, not only for the abductees, but for, you know, people like you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, I guess I get them because, uh, you know, they come to me. Now, we get uh, thousands of contacts, but it's only about 10% that... Um, are possible candidates for surgery, and then when you narrow that down, it's only about 1% of the 10% that uh, are individuals that you want to perform a surgery on. We, have a, we, we set up a really strict set of criteria and protocols for doing these cases, and we have to do that because, uh, you know, we want this pure science. <laughs> That's the same way we treat the specimens. We treat it as if it was, uh, you know, a murder case or, uh, you know, physical evidence of a crime scene. Uh, once, once they're confined in the container, they're sealed and signed. <laughs> it's never opened again uh, unless there's uh, witnesses or it's uh, photographed or videoed. So we try and protect even when they go to a laboratory. Um, the laboratory technician has to sign a document stating that the, he's receiving the uh, the uh, specimen and a container that's sealed with such and such a signature and opening uh, they're opening the container on such and such a date at such and such a time for a specific purpose, uh, you know, EDX testing or SEMs or whatever. And that's the absolute best way to do it because you're actually covering your bases. The show's going to end in about eight minutes. I wanted to use this time real quick, Dr. Lear, to let everybody know that you can find all his amazing books, especially that one that's coming soon will be on his website. It's alienscalpel.com. Again, alienscalpel.com. Find Dr. Lear's website. You'll find a whole bunch of information. And while we're on the topic of websites, I also want to mention Preston's. PrestonDennett.com. Double N, double T, D E N N E T T. There you'll see uh, his library of books too. So, all you listeners out there, be sure and check out both websites. Find amazing books on them both. You know, as we're coming down to the last few minutes of this time, I I think if we have if we had to summarize everything into you know we've had a, a great almost two hour talk of talking about these otherworldly specimens that have come from 16 different p surgeries which have been to the top of the the cream of the cream of the laboratories have tested these things what else do you think it's going to take to wake the people up doctor well i think that if everybody participated in some activity towards that goal uh people would be waking up faster than they are. For example, you just mentioned uh, uh, Preston's uh, website and Preston's books. I mean, he's got a lot of books out there, folks. Uh, buy one of his books and uh, just buy one and give it away to somebody else for a, a birthday or, or an anniversary or, or, or you know, Christmas or whatever. Take any of the reputable researchers you know, get some DVD or video or a book or whatever, uh, purchase it and give it to just one other person. And and that person will, will do the same and it'll help, you know, get the, the word out. Plus the fact that uh, folks like uh, John, uh, you're helping to wake the world up, wake people up to the actual uh, ET reality because of the radio show. So I noticed as of late there are numerous you know new radio shows, more people talking about it, and the more people talk about it, you don't have to ask a younger person, do you think there's other life in the universe? Because you know their answer, they're going to yes. say, well, yes, of course. You know, 
Uh, it seems here we have another caller coming in. I believe this is the Ivy West. Join, welcome to Revolution Radio. Hello, hello. I have been well, listening. Well, hello to there, you. Ivy. Hi, Doctor Lear. I, uh, I, what a great show! I even learned a few things that I hadn't heard you talk about before. And uh, you're one of the world's foremost alien. Uh, uh, implant removal surgeons, and it, I think it's by default you're uh, a podiatrist, and, um, you know, it just happened that you had people come along that had, uh, you know, accidentally found these things in them and removed them to find out what they were, and, uh, you know, you're just, you're doing a wonderful service, and if anybody can help Dr. Here, uh, please donate to him. You can go to his website, alienscalpel.com. He's got, uh, a huge research team, and, and your donations would really help further this research along, and that's one of the things that you can do for Dr. Lear. And I just, I'm sorry, but I, I really wanted to come in and let people know that there is a ways they can help if they can't help in some other ways. They can help the research go on, because I know you have some more uh, projects, and the, and the la last removal that you did and found out on there that that signal was the only signal that was into the astronauts in NASA is uh, is pretty significant, don't you think? Oh, I think so, and and I thank you for recommendation for uh, research donations. And I, I just want to bring up the point that ANS Research, who was responsible for the extractions and all the research on the both the biological and metallurgical materials, we don't charge a penny to anybody to have anything done. So, uh, you know, we can't many times afford, if you're in Hong Kong, to, to bring it to the United States. But uh, if you can get here, uh, as I said, there, there are no charges made for any of our services. You know, let me add in to what Ivy and Dr. Lear just said. The research, folks, is very expensive. If you notice the He's, Dr. Lear, his team, they do this pro bono, but still there are costs that we can't avoid, and it's very, very expensive. So any donations that can be made to further this research, to further another implant removal, would be great. Also, anything that they purchase from the website store is not really a purchase. It's just it's a donation to to A and S research, and they're just being rewarded with the item that they select. So uh, it's and, and it's totally tax deductible because it's a 501c3. So you're not really purchasing anything from A and S. It's just uh, you're making a donation and you're choosing uh, the product that you would like to receive. Wow, that's really nice that you allow that. Uh, so you actually get something for your donation, a memento, something to show that you're contributing and uh, just to keep the research going and all. And, and, John, you're doing a fantastic job, too, there. I know you folks had some problems earlier, but you guys hung in there <laughs> and yeah. got it straightened out. So it was it was well, very, very we, good. We, we know what that's like, don't we, Ivy? Oh, boy, that's for sure. We have the same <laughs> problem with uh, Professor Searle back at twice now, a couple weeks back, but uh, we're, we're going to get things straightened out here, and folks, you're listening to one of the radio stations, one of the uh, newest and upcoming uh, radio talk show hosts, and uh, of course, Dr. Lear has been with us for many years doing this research, and you know, we really, really do need to support the station, we need to support the researchers out there, because the government is cracking down more and more and not allowing this research to get out, and uh, or they'll just debunk it. They have so many people coming along to try and debunk this, and it's real. I completely agree. Ivy, thank you for the kind words. Sadly, this show is coming to near a close. Before.